even if you go and eat um, quote unquote real food, if it's not from a regenerative farm, there are four main minerals that are now depleted in both animal foods and plant foods across the board. And that's magnesium, calcium, copper, and iron. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. That's Pharmacy with an F, a place for conversations that matter. And if you ever thought about the fact that you might be deficient in certain nutrients, well, this is a podcast you want to listen to because we're going to talk about minerals today. And we're going to talk about it with James Nicolantonio, who's an incredible researcher, scientist, uh, is just prolific and is <laughs> constantly helping me understand the world of nutrition, minerals, and all kinds of stuff related to nutrition and health. So welcome, um, James. Thanks, Mark. Great to be so back on. Yeah, James uh, is a doctor of pharmacy. He's a cardiovascular research scientist. He's uh, known internationally for his work on health and nutrition and has actually testified in front of the Canadian Senate on the harm of added sugar. No surprise, <laughs> that's harmful. He's an associate editor of the British Medical Journal's Open Heart and uh, on the advisory board of many other medical journals. He's authored over 250 publications in scientific literature and the author of five best-selling books includes The Salt Fix, which challenges our ideas about Salt, a uh, super fuel, which I think he wrote with uh, Joe Mercola about fat and, and the diet and longevity solution, the immunity fix and the mineral fix, uh, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is minerals. So <laughs> thanks, James, for being on the doctor's pharmacy. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's great to great to be with you. OK, so we, we know when we think about food. We think about, you know, protein, fat, carbs maybe fiber, uh, we talk about vitamins and minerals, but most of us don't recognize how deficient we are. Uh, and you, you wrote that it's estimated that one in three Americans are deficient in at least 10 minerals. I mean, insufficient, deficient. How does this happen? <laughs> Why are we so deficient? And well, tell us more about this, this rampant pandemic we're having, it seems, of uh, nutritional deficiencies, even in a world of abundant calories and food. Well, that's a great way to put it. It really is a pandemic. And it really almost started in 1940. And there's three primary reasons why most of us are actually deficient in about 10 minerals. And the, the number one reason is the foods that we eat are now just simply more nutrient depleted compared to 50 to 80 years ago, because how we grow our food. The second reason is 60% of our calories come from processed foods which flour, sugar, seed oils, which essentially that eliminates 80 to 100% of the minerals in those products. And then the third factor is that at least for the majority of adults in the United States, most of them have at least one chronic health condition, which either that condition depletes us of minerals or the medications used to treat those disease states deplete us of minerals. And so we can sort of take a deep dive into each one of those um, to sort of explain to people what's happening. Yeah. And then, and then what else we get into not only, you know, why we're so deficient, but what does that mean for biology and how does that show up clinically or symptom wise? Cause it's, it's not just an idea that, Oh, I'm deficient in certain minerals. These minerals are key for our biological functioning. And when they're not inadequate amounts in our body, we get problems, we get symptoms and conditions, diseases. Um, and so it's, it's important to sort of think about, you know, why we're so deficient, but also, how do we diagnose it and what do we do about it? Because it can make a huge difference in people's health. I've, I've seen using minerals in my practice over the last 30 years in functional medicine be one of the most powerful things to help improve people's overall well-being and health. So uh, let's, let's, let's drop down and just go through each one of those four points. I think it's important. So why is the food less nutritious than it was, than it was 50 years ago? And, and what does it do with the way we grow it? Right. That's a great point. There's a, there's two main reasons why one is that we now grow food for yield. So essentially we are growing plants and animals quicker, whether we're fattening up a cow and slaughtering them at 14 months instead of two to three years. And so um, the, the animal or the plant simply does not have the time to actually take up all the nutrients. So it's literally more diluted in nutrition. Whereas if mm -hmm. we were to you know, an animal that had lived for years, it would have had much longer to actually extract nutrients from the diet. So that's number one. The other is the phosphorus fertilizers that are being used that inhibits the uptake of numerous minerals. So clinical studies have shown if you take, let's say, for example, raspberries and you use those phosphorus fertilizers, that decreases the calcium and magnesium by 30%, the boron by 30%, and same thing with the zinc. So it's, it's, kind of shifting away from regenerative farming and more to these monocropping 
increasing yield and it's leading to these nutritional dilutions compared to mm. just 60 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you know, also, uh, aside from the fact that we breed for yield and not, not flavor or nutritional density, which is one problem. Uh, and aside from the fact that, um, because of the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the plants are eating that and they grow more carbohydrates, become more starchy and less nu nutritious and less protein and minerals. And then the soil has been damaged so much by all these compounds. You're talking about even things like glyphosate that kills the microbiome of the soil. And there's a symbiotic relation between the soil microbes and the plant because the microbes and the organic matter in the soil are required to extract the nutrients from the soil to put in the plant. <laughs> so even if, the, even if the soil is full of nutrients, if there's if the if soil is dead and it's no organic matter, no microbes, the plant can't get access to those nutrients. Exactly. So that's that's 100% correct. So for example, there are some studies suggesting that glyphosate will inhibit the uptake of minerals into the plants. The mm. acidity of the soil also reduces the uptake of those minerals. So you may not necessarily see a reduction in the mineral content of the actual soil, although we know the topsoil is obviously much more nutrient depleted. But even in those instances, if the, if the soil is more acidic or you have glyphosate, then the plant there's a reduction in its uptake of nutrients. Yeah. And then the second point you made was, you know, we're eating processed food and you know, 60% of our calories basically is, is deliberately stripped of all of its nutrients. <laughs> and then it's fortified with stuff because they've taken it all out. And, and then, you know, we, we actually first saw signs of vitamin deficiency when we um, started to polish rice. Uh, and, and it was, you know, it was, it was interesting. It was given to the, the chickens in prisons in Europe and then to the prisoners and they all got really sick. Uh, and, and it was because of the vitamin deficiencies and the same thing is happening now. And then we decide we have to enrich the flour, enrich the rice, <laughs> but that's silly. Why don't eat the whole food, which has all the nutrients, but we now are seeing a massive, um, depletion of our diet in these minerals. So what are the top minerals that we're, we're depleting in our, in our food because we're eating processed food? Yeah. So there's, well, there even if you go and eat um, quote unquote real food, if it's not from a regenerative farm, there are four main minerals that are now depleted in both animal foods and plant foods across the board. And that's magnesium, calcium, copper, and iron. So mm. copper has been the worst. So vegetables have lost about 75% of their copper. Animal foods like meat have lost 50% of their copper. And then you have 80 to 90% of copper lost in cheese. And we've lost almost all of it in milk. Mm. And so really trying to source regenerative um, agriculture crops and, and foods and animals from regenerative farms is going to be much more nutrient dense. So really finding those local farmers that are, that are using like real natural manure that are not using these phosphorus, you know, artificial NPK fertilizers and glyphosate is really going to make a tremendous difference um, just from the real foods that you're eating, not even talking about the processed foods. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good way to help with that. And, and the other thing you mentioned was chronic disease and also medication cause mineral depletion. And we are now, I mean, what are the data that six out of 10 of us have a one chronic disease and four out of 10 have more than one. And I think, uh, what was it? 81% of Americans over, I think 50 or something are, are on, uh, one or more medications. I mean, 80% of Americans. So what is all that? disease and drugs doing to our mineral status. Well, exactly right. That most of us are sick. And what ends up happening is you, you, you basically, you know, don't, you're not able to absorb nutrients. Well, if you have a damaged uh, gastrointestinal tract for one. And so, so many people are suffering from gluten intolerance, celiac disease, Crohn's, um, ulcerative colitis, and if you have damage to the gastrointestinal tract, which many of us do from eating mm. these processed foods, you can't even absorb the minerals. And then even if you are able to absorb them, we require insulin to drive numerous minerals into the cell, including magnesium and potassium. And we know 75% of the U.S. population is insulin resistant and has mm. high, high insulin levels. So you can't even get it in the minerals into the cell as well when you're insulin resistant. And if you have elevations in your insulin levels that kicks out magnesium and calcium in the urine as well. And so, so wait, 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 just so we pack, unpack this. You basically eat a lot of sugar and starch, your insulin goes up and you start to pee out minerals like magnesium, 
Yeah. Yep. And you can't even drive them into the cell to utilize them. So you could be taking, you know, all the magnesium or, or calcium or, or potassium that you would like to take in a day. But if you don't fix the insulin resistance, you're never going to get the full driving of those nutrients into the cell where it actually is needed to work. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So, and, and then the other thing, you know, so you have chronic diseases, which then cause your minerals to become depleted. You have, um, you know, soils, which are not good, which allows us to sort of not get the minerals. We have processed food, which, you know, just by nature has no minerals. And then we take medications, which often are mineral depleting. And, you know, in medical school, we all learn, okay, I'll give someone a diuretic for high blood pressure or for heart failure. You have to give them potassium because the medication causes potassium to leach out in the urine, but also causes other minerals like magnesium. So talk about this general idea. You know, we talk about, oh, be careful of taking those supplements it's going to interfere with your medications. But, you know, the opposite is also true that whatever medications you're taking may be causing massive nutritional deficiencies, whether it's an acid blocker causing B12 deficiency or certain antidepressants, things causing B6 deficiency or, or you know, the diuretics causing magnesium deficiency. So talk about the minerals and the depletion of our, of our nutritional status by the, the medications. What are the top medications that cause the problems and what do they do? Well, one of the first medications a doctor will throw someone on if they have high blood pressure is something called a thiazide diuretic. So something like hydrochlorothiazide or chlorthalidone and dapamide are some of the names that um, some people may be familiar with. And you're right that the medical community thought for a long time, and they still think this, that the potassium depletion, you just give these people more potassium, but it's really the magnesium depletion that these thiazide diuretics are causing that is causing the body to not be able to hold on to potassium. So 80% of people who are on a thiazide diuretic for six months or longer are deficient in magnesium, 80%. And it's one of the most prescribed medications in the United States. What's so fascinating about that is that magnesium lowers blood pressure. <laughs> so you're kind of getting rid of the very mineral that you need to keep your blood vessels relaxed and not have high blood pressure. <laughs> in fact, that's what we give women when they come in with high blood pressure from pregnancy. We call it preeclampsia. The treatment is intravenous magnesium. <laughs> right, exactly. We used to, before we had all these types of medications, we used to treat many health conditions with magnesium, including preeclampsia. There have been yeah. many clinical studies that show that live birth rates are much better, especially if you start earlier on in your labor um, or preterm with magnesium supplementation. And so it really is um, the missing, one of the missing minerals in the diet and said that 50% of people with high blood pressure or heart disease have magnesium deficiency and half the population isn't even getting the RDA for magnesium. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's interesting, what we talk about in the mineral fix. So before you go into that, so the RDA for listening is minimum amount you need, or they call them yeah. RDIs, the, the minimum yeah. amount you need to prevent deficiency diseases. It's not how much yeah. you need for optimal health. It's like how much you need so you don't get scurvy for vitamin C or rickets, you know, vitamin D. It's not really the amount your body needs for optimal functioning. And so it's so important to rethink our approach to nutrition based on optimal performance and function rather than simply prevention of deficiency diseases, which is what our whole medical training has been around vitamins. And, and the, the interaction between the drugs and the nutrients is a really big deal. And like you're saying with, with thiazide diuretics, but there's other examples of other nutrients that get depleted. What, what are a few other examples of common medications and, and the nutrients that they deplete? Well, another common medication is proton pump inhibitors, um, which are prescription, quote unquote, um, acid suppressing therapies, as well as antacids over the counter. There's actually a third, third leading class of drugs, by the way, after statins and antidepressants, it's the third leading class of drugs. Exactly. And, and if you have heartburn or reflux, most doctors will just throw these at you and you're not really supposed to be on them for longer than two to three months at, at, at the most. Um, doctors used to just kind of put people on these for years and they started noticing that people were becoming deficient in numerous minerals, particularly magnesium. And now there's an actual black box warning that these medications can lead to magnesium deficiency, an actual black box warning. The black so, box warning is on the label. The pharmacist right. has to put this black box that says, if you take this medication, this is going to happen to you, or this may happen to you, you might get magnesium deficient. So this is, this is a kind of a big deal for that to happen. Right. Exactly. And well, that's the crux of the book. The mineral fix is that the RDA does not match the optimal intake for nutrients. And most people understand that things like refined sugars and carbohydrate and refined carbs and seed oils are bad for their health. 
But what a lot of people do not realize is that if you do not hit optimal intakes for nutrients, that is just as damaging to your body. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a big sentence. So, you know, if you are avoiding all the crap and you still don't have optimal levels of nutrients in your body, it's still harmful to you. It's extremely right? harmful. I mean, they, what was really interesting was one study, they put women on a diet that contained hundred milligrams of magnesium within just a few weeks, a third of those women developed atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. So you can induce arrhythmia simply by lowering the magnesium content of the diet. And you can see these types of harms with numerous nutrients. They've done this, this with copper as well. If you go on, this is actually what's really scary. We have the RDA completely wrong for copper. So it, it was set based on um, essentially just one or two balance studies. And they forgot to, to actually test mineral losses through sweat. They didn't think copper was lost through sweat. So they just looked at urine and stool copper loss for the RDA for copper. Well, it turns out that we lose about 0.3 milligrams of copper through sweat per day. And so the RDA doesn't even actually maintain balance for likely half of the population. And there are studies that show that if you even go slightly above the RDA, if you put someone on, let's say one milligram of copper per day, you can induce insulin resistance, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, all these problems that you would induce with a high sugar diet simply by eating a low amount of copper. Wow, that's incredible. So we've got copper, magnesium. What are the other common minerals that we're low in and, and what are the impacts of those? The top 10 minerals are really um, boron, manganese, uh, potassium, magnesium, calcium, zinc, selenium, um, even molybdenum. And when it comes to immune, immune health, we all know that zinc and selenium are extremely important. And simply being deficient in selenium can essentially turn non-virulent viruses into something that could potentially kill you. Well, you know, there's a fascinating study on COVID in China where they looked at, at areas where there was high selenium in the soil versus low selenium, where people were tending to be def deficient in selenium. They, I think they had five times higher risk of getting up in the hospital or dying or three times higher risk. It was, it was a dramatic difference between the adequate and the deficient selenium groups. And so just that's just one mineral. But we have many, many minerals that are all dynamically interacting together that regulate thousands of different biological functions. And these you know, people think, oh, well, vitamins and minerals are just, you know, not really that important, or you can get it all from your food, or, um, you know, we're not really that deficient. How could we be deficient? We're such a well-nourished country. There's so much obesity. But there's actually a phenomenon of the more obese you are, the more m mineral, nutrient, vitamin deficient you, you typically are. Uh, even like vitamin D, it's sort of striking to see this paradox of sort of obesity and malnutrition going together. Uh, and and we, we, we really have this moment to sort of look at our, our biology and go, wait a minute, how do we optimize it? Because it's not simply about, you know, getting adequate levels, it's about getting optimal levels. And that has a profound effect on our overall biology. So, so tell us a little bit more about, about um, you know, why these deficiencies drive disease. You mentioned a little bit about it, but I think uh, give us some practical examples of if, if I'm deficient X or Y, what will I see as a doctor in my practice? Well, if you think about, let's say, just let's talk about brain health, for example. Mm. So if you want to actually create the three feel-good neurotransmitters, uh, serotonin, noradrenaline, norepinephrine in the brain and dopamine, there's enzymes in the brain that require minerals to actually create serotonin and then also form melatonin from serotonin. They depend mm. on like magnesium, zinc, calcium, iron, mm. copper. If you are deficient in those minerals, uh, most doctors don't even look or test for that. They simply just mm. give you an antidepressant or if you can't sleep, they will simply give you a pill to help you sleep. But if you're deficient mm. in any of those minerals, the enzymes can't even convert tryptophan eventually to serotonin and melatonin. Mm. So a lot of these issues with sleep, anxiety, mood disorders, depression are literally being driven by these mineral deficiencies. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I've seen so much from my practice. I just remember this one patient, my doctor before, but she had you know, classic signs of magnesium deficiency. She was a doctor, uh, radiation oncology resident actually, uh, worked at Mayo Clinic and seen the top headache specialist, had intractable migraines, was on narcotics and Zofran, which is like a chemo anti-nausea drug. She, and, and so I talked to her and I said, well, tell me about your other symptoms besides the migraines. I said, how's your digestion? So, you know, I'm pretty regular. I'm like, oh, well, hey, well, how often do you go to the bathroom? She's like, I'll go once a week. And I'm like, that's not regular. She was regular for me. I'd go every week. And I'm like, no, 
you got to go every day. I said, well, how many other symptoms do you have? Well, I have anxiety. I have insomnia. I have palpitations. I have muscle cramps. I have bad menstrual cramps. These are all signs of magnesium deficiency. And if you're alert to it, and it may be other things like sensitive to loud noises or irritability or, um, and anything that sort of spasms, twitchy or irritable is typically a sign of magnesium deficiency. And that's because magnesium is a relaxation mineral. And, and when I gave her magnesium, I literally had to give her 2000 or more milligrams a day in order to get her to start going to the bathroom and relieve her headaches. And it was amazing. Once we gave her the magnesium, all of her symptoms went away. And, and, you know, what causes magnesium deficiency besides not getting your diet is things like caffeine and stress. You know, I remember one study in Kosovo where they looked at magnesium levels in the urine and they found high levels in people who were really stressed and you can't really test for it in, in, in a way that most doctors test for it. It's not really adequate. So maybe, um, would you mind just sharing a little bit about the challenge we have with testing and how we can diagnose these mineral deficiencies? Cause people are like, I'm listening to this and I'm like, do I have mineral deficiencies? Is it causing my health issues? How do you diagnose it? Because because typically traditional medicine is pretty crappy at diagnosing nutritional deficiencies and particularly around minerals. Right. That's a good question. And part of the problem is, is some of these minerals are what are called a, acute phase reactants, meaning if you have inflammation in the body, the levels of those minerals will either go up or down depending on inflammation. So for example, if you are inflamed, uh, zinc will go down, selenium will go down, and iron will go down. And you may not be deficient, but the inflammation is driving it down. On the flip side, inflammation will actually increase copper levels. So you could be deficient in copper, but the inflammation is driving your levels up because it's an acute phase reactant. The other problem is most minerals do not sit in the blood. They're mostly in the tissue or the bone. So if, take magnesium, for example, 1% of your entire body's magnesium is actually in blood. 99% is in things like muscle and bone. And of course, we're not going in and, you know, taking a sample of someone's bone or tissue to test for magnesium deficiency. So what are some of the best ways to actually look for mineral deficiencies that people can actually do? And it's really actually looking to see if you're at the lower end of normal on a blood test. So what happens with mineral deficiencies you don't typically fall below and the actual normal threshold unless you are significantly deficient. But what will happen is you will go from a middle point of normal just to the lower end of normal. And if you're sitting on that lower end of normal, especially if you have a low amount coming out in the urine, that is highly indicative of mineral deficiency. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, <laughs> we, we uh, in medicine, we're learning lab tests and we see, okay, this is the normal range, you know, but when you, understand what normal means it's a statistical number based on the population so if i were to land in america from mars and i go hmm, what's the normal weight of americans well given that 75 percent are overweight it's normal to be overweight it doesn't mean it's optimal and in addition we use this sort of two standard deviations meaning we use a wide bell curve for figuring out what's normal so you could be two or 92 and it's still the same reference range <laughs> Right. And, it, and, and maybe it should be like one standard deviation should be where we thinking is optimal and anything outside above or below is, is a problem. And I think we're learning this in medicine that, that disease is not just an on or off phenomena. It's a continuum. So you might, for example, see blood sugar being normal up to a hundred, but in fact, we know that if your blood sugar is over 87, according to Israeli studies, that your risk goes up of heart disease and death in a linear way. So 88 is worse than 87 and 90 is worse than 88. And, and the same thing with nutrition. I mean, we, we, we don't want too much, but we don't, we, we don't want to make sure we have optimal levels. And, uh, you know, magnesium is an interesting phenomenon. When I, uh, you know, started practicing magnesium is one of those miracle drugs that I was started using in functional medicine. It's like incredible. It helped people sleep with, with all sorts of issues. And, uh, it's hard to test because the typical thing I learned in medical school was just check a serum magnesium level. So you're saying if it's a low end of normal, which is like two, then you're worried. You're worried. But by the time it gets there, you're already pretty depleted. Um, right. and, and then you can look, look at red cell levels, which is a little bit better, which is what's in the cells because typically magnesium is more in the cells. Uh, but that also isn't perfect, although it can be a little bit better. And then there's the real test, which is a magnesium loading test where you basically deplete the body of magnesium. You don't, get take it for a while you give a big magnesium load and then you collect the urine for 24 hours because that'll tell you how much spills out if you hold all the urine if you hold all the magnesium in your body it means you're pretty deficient if you don't pee it out 
And yet no, nobody does that test. Uh, there are other indirect tests we use like organic acid testing and, and so forth. And amino acids, we can sort of indirectly tell whether there's some nutritional deficiencies, but it's really tough. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you to all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter and I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. So besides magnesium, um, what are the other tests? If you're, if you're uh, you know, wanting to know what your nutritional status, do you just go to a regular doctor and get regular tests? Or what, what are the best tests for the top things like selenium, zinc, magnesium we talked about, uh, copper? Yeah. So the best test um, that has actually uh, been matched against the gold standard IV magnesium load is actually mononuclear blood cell magnesium levels. So the white that cell is, level, yeah, it's a white blood cell. It's called mononuclear blood cell. And um, it's the only blood test that I've ever seen that actually correlates well with the IV magnesium load, which is the gold standard for testing for magnesium deficiency. So um, that typically though is not ordered by your doctor. And that's the problem, right? Is that you would think the first thing you would, that all of us would know is we would have a, a list of 20, 30, 40 vitamins and minerals and we would understand if we're deficient or not. And our doctor would first instantly say, okay, you're deficient in 10 minerals. Here's the foods you need to start eating to, to replace those. They don't do that. They just say high cholesterol, high blood sugar, high blood pressure. Here's this pill, this pill, and this pill. And they send you on your way. And that's the problem. We need to get health insurance companies to, to pay for and reimburse for vitamin mineral tests. Because you can do hair analysis, it's not perfect, but that is a three month reflection of blood. So that's a potentially better way for numerous minerals. Uh, you always want to have serum as well. And you want the serum to be not on the lower end of normal. Uh, and then you can also do many other tests, but typically it's white blood cells that you look at for minerals, um, mm -hmm. whether it be neutrophils or leukocytes, uh, leukocyte copper, uh, neutrophil zinc are some of the best tests to actually uh, get for those minerals. And people can do that through the regular lab test? Typically, I mean, typically doctors don't do that. There's, there's certain companies that specialize in those type of tests. Um, and some have their own unique methods for doing this, mm. but that's the problem. Um, we don't have insurance companies demanding or paying for these better tests or minerals. So most people are stuck with serum and they just, you just want to make sure that you're definitely not at the lower end of normal on serum. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we are seeing that there's massive deficiencies. We probably need to take something. How, how do these nutritional deficiencies of micronutrients um, have on our health span and lifespan and in terms of longevity and premature aging? And, and how do we, you know, how do we get to avoid premature aging and increase our longevity? So what we sort of need to understand is everybody focuses on macronutrients, right? How much uh, carbohydrates versus how much fats you have people that are high carb, people that are um, low carb. Um, they forget that it's the minerals that determine how well you actually convert uh, those macronutrients into energy, uh, how well you, your muscle can grow, how much ATP you can produce. Everything is dependent mm -hmm. on that. Uh, so I, I, I kind of laugh when people say it's all about calories with weight loss when literally your fat burning machinery depends on minerals. So some people can be eating uh, a low calorie diet, but a nutrient a micronutrient deficient diet, you're going to gain much more weight than someone who is eating more calories, but are getting more minerals because your fat burning machinery will actually work better. So take, take magnesium, for example, um, you cannot activate ATP without magnesium. It binds to ATP, it cleaves the terminal phosphate and it releases energy. Everything depends on ATP. 
magnesium is required to produce protein, DNA, RNA. I don't know a single function in the body that does not work without ATP and protein and DNA. So literally everything depends on minerals. And so mm. like you had said, I mean, magnesium is the relax uh, mineral. It prevents calcium from actually uh, accumulating in, in, the, uh, in the arteries. So one sign of mineral deficiency is coronary artery calcification, which mm. a lot of docs are starting to use versus just cholesterol tests. Yeah. So how does mineral deficiency cause the calcium deposit? So essentially magnesium is a, is nature's calcium channel blocker and it prevents the, the cells the endothelial cells that are lining the arteries from accumulating calcium. And so there is this balance we talk about in the book that it's not also just about the, the overall amount of minerals you're getting. It's the balance between them. You have mm -hmm. to don't want to have really more than a two to three to one ratio of calcium to magnesium. Otherwise you're going to start getting issues because the balance is off. Yeah. Interesting. So the thing we often hear about, let's just sort of talk about some of these chronic age related diseases is, you know, high blood pressure is an issue. And we're, we're taught that we should not be eating salt or having too much salt because it can cause high blood pressure. Um, and, and yet, you know, you challenge that whole hypothesis. We've had you talking about this before, I think on an Instagram live or a podcast. And, and you wrote this book called Salt Fix, which challenges our notion of salt being the enemy and the evil that we thought it is. Although it is for some people. Can you kind of break down in just sort of a short nugget, you know, what, what is the right thinking about salt and, and where have we gone wrong and how do we fix it? <laughs> if you eliminate refined carbs and sugar, you make sure you're getting enough magnesium. You make sure you're getting enough potassium. Only 1% of the population would probably actually have a significant rise in blood pressure with a normal salt intake. In other words, it's not the salt. The problem is the sugar and the mm. refined carbs that are causing you to over retain salt. Yeah. And so it's really not a problem for most people if they fix those three underlying causes. And that's sort of what I discuss in the mineral fix and the salt fix. The three causes of being again of over retaining salt would be insulin resistance, low potassium, low magnesium intake. Okay. So this seems so easy to fix. You get magnesium, you get potassium, which we get from vegetables and plant foods, right? And you cut out the starch and sugar. And, you know, as a doctor, what's interesting when I tell people to cut out starch and sugar, what happens is the body starts to dump huge amounts of salt right. and you get all kinds of quote side effects from going on a low carbohydrate diet including, you know, feeling achy, tired, wiped out. And it's like essentially having electrolyte depletion. And the reason that you're doing that is not because your body's doing something wrong. It's because before you were having so much sugar and starch, your body was holding onto all this salt. And so then it dumps fluid and salt, which is a good thing, <laughs> but you have to make sure you get adequate salt while you're doing that, because if you don't, you're going to feel like crap. <laughs> and so it's really important for people who do switch their diets to understand that you can, and the same thing happens with the keto flu, you know, it was this whole idea that the keto flu and you go keto and you kind of all carbohydrates, you get sick like the flu, but that's because of the mineral depletion from the dumping of the salt from the lower levels of insulin in the blood, which is after you cut out the starch and sugar. So it's really, it's a really important idea. Uh, but there are, but there are people who are salt sensitive and have salt sensitive hypertension, right? The African-American community has more of that. Is that, is that fair to say? It's fair. It, yeah, they do have more, but typically it's because their dietary potassium magnesium is very low and they eat mm -hmm. high amount of refined carbs and sugars. And what's interesting, mm -hmm. you give those people metformin and you help fix their insulin resistance and you actually fix most of their salt sensitivity. So in, in the mineral fix and the salt fix, especially we, we cover a couple of those clinical studies, you give salt sensitive people metformin, or you put them on a lifestyle, better diet, and you fix their insulin resistance they're no longer salt sensitive. So really one of the best measures of insulin resistance is if you're salt sensitive. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. So yeah, I've, I see, you know, a lot of my patients, as soon as they change their diet, boom, their blood pressure comes down and it's, they have to start peeling off the medications because their blood pressure drops too low. So it's sort of paradoxical to think that actually maybe it's not the salt, it's the lack of potassium and magnesium, which are rampant deficiencies. And potassium, you know, comes from, mostly plant food. So you say, oh, eat a banana for potassium, but it's, if you just make a big vegetable broth or, you know, make a good soup, even like uh, seaweed, I like to put seaweed in the soup that helps you get a lot of potassium and, and extra minerals. So that's really important. Uh, seaweed's a great source of minerals, isn't it? Yeah, it, no, it absolutely is. And that's a good point that just being a little bit low in potassium can cause you to over retain salt. And so again, it's this balance. You need to make sure typically what I do 
I probably get four grams of potassium per day and four grams of sodium. And I don't have high blood pressure and it dramatically improves my performance. Most people don't really utilize salt correctly. Uh, okay, before, you, before you go on, just the average recommendation is like two grams or less for salt, right? It's, it's two right. and a half. So you're saying we eat twice the amount of salt that our, our current experts are recommending, but you also eat a lot of potassium and it seems to balance out. Exactly. So the typical American is only consuming maybe two and a half grams of potassium. And that's the problem. If they bump mm -hmm. that up to about four grams, then most of those individuals wouldn't have an issue with uh, a normal salt intake. And I mean, I've published numerous papers on why we recommend such a low intake of salt, and it's strictly based on blood pressure. Um, mm -hmm. But they never look at the other surrogate markers that are actually worsened on a low salt diet. So for example, you may have a slightly lower blood pressure, but that's not necessarily good. I can dehydrate you and tell you to only drink two ounces of water per day and lower your blood pressure. So to mm -hmm. think that that one surrogate marker is the most important is, is, you know, really just narrow focused. But if you look at the harms like stress hormones, aldosterone, renin, angiotensin two, those artery stiffening hormones, they all increase with a low salt diet. If you go below three grams of sodium per day, all those stress hormones increase. Yeah. So I mean, historic we're all picture. Yeah. I mean, that's great. It's really helpful. I mean, historically, you know, as hunter gathers, we probably had 10 to one, I mean, sorry, you know, one to one sodium potassium. Now we often have 10 to one uh, right. sodium to potassium. And, that, and that's coming probably primarily from processed food. I always say it's not the salt or sugar you add to your food. It's the sugar or salt that's added by corporations that's hidden in your food. That's the problem. Uh, and the amount, of, I mean, you probably wouldn't be able to tolerate that much salt if you just put it on your food. But when it's sort of buried in tasteless, you know, refined ingredients, it kind of makes it all taste good, but it's actually uh, killing you. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, getting a normal salt intake is actually one of the best ways to reduce sugar cravings because mm -hmm. one of the mechanisms, the survival mechanisms that we had uh, that you can see this in animals when they're depleted, how do they know to go to a salt that can actually eat salt? Like yeah. how do they actually do that? Yeah. Right. It's because their reward center in the brain is actually hyperactivated. So that's what happens in humans as well. If you don't get enough salt, your reward center is hyperactivated and you get, you get more of a dopamine response to things like sugar, Adderall, or, or any type of uh, addictive substance. And so low salt can literally drive sugar addiction. Hmm. That's incredible. All right, let's talk about COVID-19 uh, because we're in the middle of this pandemic. And it's clear that minerals play a role in the prevention and potentially even treatment of, of COVID. And we did see with, with uh, you know, our government recommendations, they're not including all these guidelines about how to upgrade your nutrition or improve the quality of the food you're eating or take these supplements. Although I was sort of surprised when President Trump had COVID, they put him in the hospital in the New York Times, they report, oh, he's taking zinc and he's taking vitamin D. <laughs> you know, so they actually were like, wow, you know, they're, they're, they're practically applying it in the hospital, but they're not telling Americans to do this. So talk about what are the key nutrients that can worsen COVID outcomes if you're deficient and, and what we should do about it. Yeah, I put together a pretty good chart in some of the books on the top nutrient deficiencies and how much they actually increase the risk of having a poor outcome or dying from COVID. The, the, the top nutrient deficiency would be vitamin D. Um, essentially, if you are significantly vitamin D deficient, you're at a, up to 15 fold higher risk of dying from mm -hmm. COVID and times higher risk of having a poor COVID outcome. Selenium and zinc sit, as you said, somewhere between a three to five fold higher risk of having a poor COVID outcome or dying from COVID if you're deficient in those minerals. And I mean, I love this example that, I, that we, there was a non-virulent RNA virus called coxsackievirus. It causes hand, foot, and mouth in some kids, but in adults, it doesn't do much unless you're selenium deficient. If you're selenium deficient and get coxsackievirus, you end up with Kishan disease, cardiomyopathy, and you potentially die from the virus because you're selenium deficient. And we treat these people by just giving them selenium. So this would obviously translate to other RNA viruses as well. So we have a clear past example that mineral deficiencies can lead to fatal outcomes from an RNA virus. So why this isn't being talked about with COVID is beyond me. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, it's incredible. I, and the selenium study from China was so fascinating about COVID-19 and the dramatic changes in outcomes just based on one mineral and, and, you know, zinc also, how does zinc play a role in immunity and, and what is it, what is it, um, what is the role of zinc in the body? 
So there's two different sort of mechanisms. So zinc lozenges have a direct antiviral effect, right? You know, reducing um, viral replication and penetration into the cell. Mm -hmm. um, that's why there's these, you know, so quote unquote zinc ionophores that are trying to get more zinc into the cell as well. And then you have zinc that just controls numerous uh, immune cell health and they utilize zinc for, um, you know, helping to kill viruses. And actually magnesium is probably one of the most important because the ionic magnesium in immune cells actually controls their uh, receptors to uh, be able to attack viruses. Mm -hmm. So um, zinc, magnesium, selenium is important for the antioxidant functions. Most, we don't, we kind of think of vitamins as being the antioxidants in the body, but it's actually the minerals uh, mm, because they really? actually control our antioxidant enzymes. Um, yeah. So there's like copper, zinc, superoxide dismutase, which it's the superoxide anion that depletes us of our nitrogen oxide. And so mm -hmm. not getting enough minerals can actually reduce nitric oxide and increase blood pressure. Okay, let, so, let me unpack that for a minute because I think you just not people and people are going to necessarily get that. So basically your body has its own antioxidant system. And there's some very powerful antioxidants like superoxide dismutase, you know, catalase, uh, and so forth. And right. these, in order for these things to function, they need the right amounts and the right types of nutrients. So you're saying copper and zinc are important for, uh, or, or, or selenium and, and copper, important for superoxide dismutase. And selenium is important for glutathione peroxidase. So there's a lot of these important antioxidants that our bodies make that are way more powerful than any antioxidants you can take by taking a supplement. And then they need the right levels of these minerals to function. And what you're seeing is that 80% of us are deficient in, a, in, in these nutrients. And yet uh, we're not taking advantage of this knowledge from science to actually upgrade our, our own immune and antioxidant systems. Exactly. What's actually really interesting is 3 billion years ago when algae was producing oxygen, and this is where oxidative stress even comes from, right? Is the actual change in the atmospheric oxygen um, by these, you know, things like blue green algae, the first antioxidants that they used against their, the defense of their own production of oxidative stress was iodine and selenium in the algae. They were, minerals were actually the first antioxidants in the first life forms on earth. Mm. And what's really interesting, even protection of the mitochondria depends on minerals. So superoxide dismutase is not just in the blood and in and helping the cytosol in the actual mitochondria. There's something called manganese superoxide mm, dismutase mm -hmm. protects the mitochondria, and we know that's the powerhouse of the cell and produces ATP. So if you can't protect your own mitochondria because you're nutrient depleted, you cannot protect yourself from oxidative stress. Yeah, which is a big deal. <laughs> and and now with COVID, we're really seeing the need for increased levels of some of these nutrients like selenium and zinc. Um, Talk about iodine because, uh, you know, we, we all were eating iodized salt. There was a big problem with goiters and thyroid issues because of massive iodine deficiency in, in history. Um, and so we decided to supplement salt with iodine, but now people are eating iodine free salt and sea salt. And what I recommend the Redmond salt from, from, uh, from real salt from Redmond. I mean, so how do we, how do we have to think about iodine in the you know, 21st century? Cause I, I'm now seeing when I test people, uh, iodine deficiencies. And, and I'm sort of surprised about it, but I think it might be because of our change in our dietary consumption of the type of salt we're eating. Can you talk about why, why um, it's a problem and what we should be taking? Should we be taking iodized salt? Should we be adding iodine? Should we be eating more seaweed or fish? What, what should we be doing? Well, well, that's a great question. And one of the primary reasons that a lot of people don't realize is we actually lose a lot of iodine through sweat. So we don't just lose salt, we lose iodine. And I think mm -hmm. that's the keys, we lose about 50 micrograms per hour of exercise. So if you're not mm, mm. a natural salt that contains the iodine, right, you are then just simply becoming depleted. And we know that iodine controls our thyroid hormones, right? Iodine literally makes up T3, T4, and that controls our metabolism. So you could literally uh, have low thyroid functioning, not only from a lack of nutrients, particularly iodine, but also salt because salt is required to drive iodine into the thyroid uh, uh, organ. So, and it actually moves a lot of other nutrients as well, salt. So the reason why we are likely deficient in iodine is A, our salts are typically depleted in it, unless you're consuming a healthy, something like a Himalayan or Redmond or uh, you're just over exercising and you're, you're losing that iodine through sweat. Mm -hmm. 
So do we think we should be taking iodine uh, supplements? Should we be? Well, there's a narrow, there's kind of like this narrow therapeutic range with iodine. And so, uh, you know, you have to be careful because typically the, the sweet spot is about 150 to 250 micrograms per day. Um, but you start getting into the three, 400, and you can actually start increasing the risk of thyroid disorders and uh, autoimmune issues. It's, mm-hmm. uh, and so, so selenium is actually what's really important too with thyroid health. Yeah. Uh, right. And in order to activate the thyroid hormones, selenium is required to do that. Uh, so it depends on your overall intake. If you're getting, if you're eating a lot of pastured eggs and you're getting a lot of sources, good sources of iodine, maybe you don't need it. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're not eating good amounts of iodine, then yeah, you probably want to either get it uh, through supplementation or through a salt that actually contains it. But there is that narrow therapeutic range with iodine. You got to be a little careful. Yeah. So talk about the food we should be eating and the minerals that are in the food. Let's let's break down like the foods by the top minerals that we see are deficient. That you sort of outlined, give us the top ones, and then sort of quickly go through what are the foods that these minerals are found in, and how do we increase the intake of those. Okay. That's a, good, that's a really good question. So how I sort of build my diet is I start with um, about 10 to 12 ounces, let's say of pastured red meat. Typically I'd like to actually do bison or elk or venison because that's true ancestral meat. And those meats actually have about 50% more minerals than even grass fed uh, cattle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's, there's n- numerous reasons for that. We don't need to go into that, but I try to eat true ancestral meat. And then I try to build, um, things off of that. Because if you're not getting a little bit of red meat, it's going to be very difficult to get the B12, the protein, the zinc, and um, uh, the iron, uh, right? Because those four nutrients are packed in animal foods. And once once you have that down, then you can build and start adding plant foods to that, right? Um, and so plant foods are really great for things like potassium and magnesium. And that's the key. A lot of people and calcium, a lot of people are deficient in calcium, potassium, magnesium. And it's like, get, try to get those greens uh, into the diet, uh, because they're very, very high. Like kale and spinach are high in potassium, calcium, magnesium. Um, and magnesium is very, very low in most animal foods. Yeah. So, and it's high, also high in beans and greens and, yeah. and nuts and nuts, a lot of magnesium and nuts, right? Yes. Um, and some fish has a decent amount of magnesium. Um, some actually, I, what I love is lobster and crab because, uh, A, it doesn't really destroy our ecosystem like fishing does. The fishing Mm -hmm. industry destroys um, the the ecosystem. But um, it's great, great sources for copper, magnesium, iodine, selenium. And then a lot of of people do really well with just like an ounce of pastured liver per day for the copper folate and vitamin A. Just adding a little bit of pastured liver uh, is a great source for those nutrients. You can get um, folate and... um, vitamin A through a pastured eggs. So I think some, most people should be consuming a little bit of pastured eggs as well, because that brings vitamin D. It's very difficult to get vitamin D in the diet unless you're consuming um, pastured eggs. And they're also good sources of lutein, zeaxanthin, um, omega-3s as well. So I like to have yeah. some three pastured, three to four pastured eggs per day, uh, some pastured red meat, one ounce of liver, or a half ounce of liver per day, and then you can do your plant foods for magnesium, potassium, mm-hmm. calcium. Yeah, and the liver, you know, the liver has actually <laughs> more, more <laughs> vitamin C than carrots or apples. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. If you, you look at your, for, for a hundred gram portion, for example, of an apple or, or so you get like seven milligrams of vitamin C. <clears throat> With beef liver, you get like 27 milligrams of vitamin C. So actually it is probably the most powerful superfood on the planet, believe it or not. And is higher in most nutrients and minerals, uh, than, than, than plant foods. Uh, well, what's interesting too, is that uh, stressed out animals actually produce up to 10 times more vitamin C. So if we were actually hunting an animal, we would be stressing that animal out incredibly. And it would be its production of vitamin C would have been much higher. And we don't typically eat fresh meat, but we've sort of lost our vitamin C through that mechanism. We sort of buy supermarket foods that have been hanging for two, three weeks, and that doesn't have nearly as much vitamin C as a fresh kill would have. So the key is, is try to eat as fresh as possible when you can. So, so basically you're sort of outlining like, you know, 
grass fed or wild meats, a little bit of liver, egg, pasture aged eggs, lots of greens, vegetables, uh, and also nuts and seeds. I mean, selenium is high, for example, in Brazil, Brazil nuts and zinc is high in pumpkin seeds. And I mean, iodine is high in seaweed uh, and obviously fish. Uh, so by understanding where these come from, you can start to create a diet that is actually more nutrient dense. Uh, but but you're often saying that, that that's not enough, even if we figured out how to eat all the foods that, you know, and I, I had once had a patient, she was obsessed. She was like, look, I don't want to take any vitamins. So I'm going to have my like three Brazil nuts a day, my 17 pumpkin seeds and my, <laughs> she figured it all out. And I, I guess that's okay to do, but make sure you check and test to see that you're actually using and absorbing it. What, what assuming we're doing all the, great dietary changes that help us upgrade our mineral intake. Um, uh, who should be taking supplements? What should we be taking? How do we get these and upgrade our mineral levels? Right. And, the, and that, that comes down to the difference between are you getting the RDA and are you getting an optimal intake? And so, and, and what's your diet actually made up of? So what's interesting is the, you only need about 150 milligrams of magnesium to live per day but the optimal intake is sits more around 700 milligrams. So it's like a three, fourfold difference between just maintaining balance and having optimal intakes of minerals. And same thing with copper and selenium and the list goes on and on. So mm -hmm. whether you're building your diet appropriately, like some of the foods that we talked about and hitting optimal nutrient intakes, then maybe you don't need to supplement as much. Um, but most people are still going to be lacking boron and manganese um, because those nutrients are very, very difficult to source um, in the diet. So, mm. so probably the, those would be great to take. And a lot of people are deficient in magnesium, even eating, um, good amounts of the, the foods we talked about. And so I, I love to drink mineral waters for that reason, natural, um, mineral waters like Gerald Steiner, which is high in magnesium and calcium and, and bicarbonate to offset some of the acidosis from the animal foods that I consume. It's a really good bioavailable source of, of minerals as well. Yeah. So the, the key is, is to, um, one, make sure your diet is upgraded. So uh, just to review, you know, magnesium is found in nuts and seeds and, and greens and beans. Selenium is high in Brazil nuts, pumpkin seeds, uh, and I'm saying oysters <laughs> have high zinc. Uh, and so does, so does uh, animal protein, as you mentioned. Uh, iodine, you know, you can get from fish or seaweed. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these other, harder to get minerals. You sometimes need to use mineral waters or supplements. Um, you know, should everybody be taking a, a multi-mineral supplement? Um, should we be taking more of some or other minerals? Uh, should all we be testing first before we take minerals or should we just assume it's okay to take them? And uh, what's your, what's your sense? Well, this is, this is really interesting. They did, they did a study. They looked at the typical diet and uh, fifty percent of the population was deficient in things like magnesium, calcium. Then they gave them a multivitamin mineral. Almost the same amount of people were still deficient because they don't. Uh, typical multivitamins and minerals don't add back the key nutrients that are missing in our diet, like magnesium, um, like calcium, uh, like copper. So it's it's like the multivitamin mineral doesn't get you there for a lot of those that are still deficient. <clears throat> Yeah. And that's something that people take, right? Things like calcium or magnesium um, or, or even copper because of that. And so I do think a lot of people probably would benefit from, from actually taking uh, not just a multivitamin mineral, but separate minerals, especially things like selenium, zinc, um, because it's, it's typically not high enough as well in those type of uh, multis. So why, why would you say you, you need the extra because you're not getting the high enough dose is what you're saying. But if you got a a good right. dose as a multi-mineral, you'd be okay. But the things that I think are most important people take are magnesium. That's a miracle supplement. Zinc is another common one that I'll clinically use. Calcium, often I think people can get from their diet if they upgrade things like chia seeds and tahini and sesame seeds and other things that have a really powerful, you know, mineral content. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, we'll give extra uh, iodine or chromium or boron, depending on the clinical situation. But what you're saying is we sometimes need to take separate minerals because of this and we need to measure our levels and we need to upgrade our diet. And that will help to address this sort of rampant mineral deficiency in our society. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, the other thing people don't realize is they don't think, Oh, you know, uh, I'm going to take this medication and it's going to work on this single pathway doing this one thing, right? A proton pump inhibitor for acid blocks this one pathway in your stomach. The problem is that, <laughs> 
<laughs> these, these are not like drugs. Nutrients are multifunctional substances that literally affect dozens to hundreds of different biological processes every second, right? You have 37 billion billion chemical reactions every second in your body. And every one of those reactions needs an enzyme and the vitamin minerals are the helpers for those enzymes. So magnesium might help regulate hundreds of different enzymes, all doing the things like you mentioned, whether it's keeping your blood pressure good or your brain function or your DNA regulation. I mean, all of these things are so critical to our biology and when we're low in these nutrients, even though they're in small amounts, can have profound effects. I mean, we really profound effects. And, and uh, you know, I, just, just, just an example, uh, we, I used to work in the emergency room and um, we had this incredible uh, scene where people would come in with alcoholism, they'd be completely wiped out, uh, drunk and have never eaten food. They're very nutrition deficient. They get uh, thiamine deficiency uh, and they have encephalopathy, which means they're basically psychotic. You just give them a vitamin and the psychosis goes away overnight, like literally. So that's the power of these nutrients, incredibly small doses that can have profound biological effects. Right. And we didn't, I mean, we didn't even know about um, these <clears throat> issues like you said, until we started polishing rice, right. Or until people started doing these abnormal things to their bodies. And then all of a sudden you just give one, you give thiamine to someone um, and all of a sudden, right. It, it goes away. And so sometimes health really is that simple. Yeah. But the th it's just in the vitamin or mineral that you're deficient in. Well, this is such a great conversation. I think, you know, we're, we're really need to pay attention to this now more than ever, given this idea that, uh, we're more nutrition deficient ever. The COVID is actually exposing that. Uh, and, and we have you know, overnutrition of, of starch and sugar and undernutrition of, of real nutrients. Uh, in your book, The Mineral Fix, How to Optimize Our Mineral Intake for Energy, Longevity, Immunity, and Sleep, and more is out now. It's great. It's on Amazon. Go there and get it. Uh, and it's called The Mineral Fix. Uh, it'll really enlighten you. It's a big book. It's like, I think of it as like a Bible for minerals. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is a big book. <laughs> it's going to cost me extra money to ship it home from Hawaii. <laughs> and, and I think, uh, you know, we just can really, by tweaking our nutrition, particularly the micronutrients, can have a profound effect. And they don't just make expensive urine like uh, we all were taught in medical school. So, so, James, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for being so obsessive about nutrition and studying the literature and translating it for all of us. Uh, your work is really quite amazing. Uh, and all the scientific papers you write are just fabulous. I've learned so much from them and, uh, and continue what you're doing. Um, and for those of you listening, uh, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends and family um, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast, leave a comment, tell us how you've been affected by mineral deficiencies and what you've learned about it. And we'd love to hear from you and we'll see you next time on the doctor's pharmacy. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to want to check out this next video coming up. We have to take proactive steps to protect our DNA. And some of the things that, that we can do are pretty simple. Like, for example, we know that an uh, elemental uh, vitamin, vitamin C, can actually do it. 